Peace, peace. How you doing? Uh, ecstatic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I gotta get rid of the phantom belly. You know when you wear a t-shirt, like <laughs> you sit. Hey man, you know. Hey, cor- Corona been kind to me. Uh, well, tonight. Okay. What What have I been up to? Uh, well, tonight I'm here. And heavyweight for the the inaugural show um, as a one of the featured artists in this amazing group show, and uh, really excited about that, and, and, and really uh, appreciative of the opportunity. Um, outside of that, I just been, you know, I got a bookstore in Long Beach that I, you know, is a community hub that I order operations out of. <laughs> You know, for our revolution that we're, we're, we're participating in currently. And uh, I've been teaming up. I've been very blessed. Uh, I have a friendship with an amazing artist by the name of uh, Lauren Halsey. And uh, she uh, has allowed me the opportunity to, you know, feed people in my neighborhood in, uh, in central Long Beach. You know, so we've been giving out fruits, boxes of fruits and vegetables to people uh, every week for like the last two months, just about. So in the midst of, you know... Selling books, selling art, giving fruits and vegetables away, you know, it was pretty well, well well balanced, I would say. Yeah. Oh, man. The people love it, you know. Uh, the, the, I would say the establishment, city-wise and non-profit industrial complex-wise, are not too thrilled. Uh, they called the health department on me a couple times now <laughs> but outside of that things have been good like you know the first couple of weeks you know i would have to knock on all the buildings you know it's in the neighborhood i grew up on so in burnett and i would have to knock on the buildings and kind of let people know and you know some people were like i don't want i'm, I'm okay on that now you know i mean just yesterday we gave out 102 boxes and um you know it's people who are really not only do they need it do they need it, but they're getting access to organic produce that they're getting access to organic produce in a way that is not only affordable because it's free, but like here, I mean, your neighborhood, not drive two, three miles away, five miles away, prove that you're poor, you know, prove to me so I can get my deliverables. You get all these drive throughs being approved in the, the, the low income neighborhoods and what are they serving the people they're serving them poison live poison whereas you get into more affluent areas you don't have this uh, this this concentration of of uh, toxic you know, toxic trash that we're serving the children especially in a, in a mindset you know it's the coronavirus right now going around and people are dying because of underlying conditions and yet the only food that they have access to is the food that creates underlying conditions you know so I'm just doing my part, you know, I'm very, I'm very blessed to be, you know, privileged enough to be in a, in a position um, to, to, to help. So I, I look at it as, a, as it's helping me more than it's helping others. So. Sure, sure, sure. 
Well, that, I think that's actually very amazing that you bring that up because it ties into one of the prints, you know. Um, you know what's happening in Wisconsin right now is it's, it's the same old shit, right? And But now it's getting elevated because now you have these white militias, you know, for, so Jacob got attacked, right? And he was, he was brutally attacked by the police. Um, you know, I don't understand how you can shoot someone seven times. Uh, with three children, with three children in the car, um, but okay, they'll they'll figure out a way to meander around that, and then you have a protest, which is a natural American response, as is the case, and then you have these white militia people who are, you know, they're 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 putting out the call to action to all their brethren from across the country, and now they're they're targeting the protests and the protesters with violence, you know, active domestic terrorist violence and i don't even understand how i'm supposed to respond peacefully you know like i'm gonna be honest i seen the thing with old boy uh whatever is i don't want to say his name the kid and i went up they gave him water and they said we appreciate you and they did all their little bat signal you know whatever you know aryan nonsense Yeah. Definitely not. And you know, I went. I'm gonna be honest. I went to the gun store. Uh, you know, yesterday, uh, two days ago, actually. And uh, yeah, I, I got. A, I, I I acquired. You know, I went and acquired yeah. firearms. I just don't. I don't feel. You know, I got people that depend on me. Immediate family wise, I got a family, and I just don't feel safe when I see stuff like that. I don't feel safe, and I don't really feel. Uh, it's appropriate for somebody to tell me, okay, now let's march. Like, how am I march? I got people literally targeting the protesters now. You can't even march outside. So what is the response? And for me, that's how I display within the piece with the Christopher Dorner, you know, because that was a that was a response. To me, that brought, I was in LA, you know, and I, I saw he brought fear into the heart of, you know, these stormtroopers. And, and it really, it really hurt them to see not only one of their own, but one of their own who happened to be a black man targeting them for their crimes against the citizens yeah. and their crimes against civilians and targeting them in the same way that they target us with death, you know? So I felt like that he's a patron saint. And for a lot of what we're going on, he foretold a lot of that, that manifesto of his. And we see it today. And the people wasn't ready. I remember I was at work. I was at a warehouse. I don't want at a, a, a skate company not, not too far from here. And I remember watching the news at lunch, at our lunch, and cheering him on. And everyone I thought was so liberal or so, you know, fuck the law. Everyone I like, they they weren't. They were, and it really made me realize, like, man, there's a lot of people who are low key, like they are about they are about that, and I'm not. And you know, it was a very definitive moment, uh, not for me just politically, but also like where I stand for where things are gonna go. And where I want to represent myself as an artist, so I made that print and I wore it. I wore the shirt, you know, and uh, they let me go. They let me go. So, you know, that being said, and then with the other, you don't mind if I say with the other print I got the spook one. You know, listen, re re Sam Greenlee, he was the man. He 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 wrote a book about this, it's the spook who sat by the front door. If you haven't read the book uh, or watched the movie, and there are tactics that. A lot of people are using against us that we don't realize that are in that book that a lot of these so-called activist types, they need to read and understand the playing field and how to maneuver. Because the reality is, you know, we see a lot of people in certain organizations, they're just trying to um, assimilate into the power structures that already are undermining reform in this country. You know, how is it that we're in the state of California, which is allegedly the most progressive state in this country, and you got a Democratic supermajority in the legislator, legislature, and they can't even get no police reform passed. Why is that? Because they supposedly say, oh, it's Trump. Trump's the only one saying blue lives matter. The Republicans is the blue lives matter. Nah, both of y'all blue lives matter. Because uh, really, it's green lives matter. Because both of y'all getting paid, Democrat and Republican, getting paid from the police unions. So if you're taking police union money, I highly doubt that you're going to establish or push forward from committee into the onto the floor any kind of legislation that is against 
the police, you know? And so I'm just kind of over these tactics of like division. You know, you got people on social media every day fighting against each other like 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 sports are still around you know people treating the politics like oh you, you a laker fan i'm a clipper fan and like i'm a community fan i'm a community i'm a fan of the neighborhood i live in so you know it, it shows itself within the art and it shows itself within our, the actions that i'm uh, i'm a part of and uh thank you appreciate it hope i wasn't too long-winded no 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 you are the best, you are the best. <laughs> cool cool shout out to heavyweights thanks for having me My name is Angela Nguyen. And what do you make for this group show? For this group show, I made two rugs. The first one is Junipero Serra, which is um, a tufted rug of Father Junipero Serra um, getting toppled over. And then the second rug that I made was uh, the Lethal Virus rug, which is essentially celebrating the COVID, not even celebrating, in some ways, sadly celebrating the, co yeah. the beginning of the COVID era, which was in California, March 16th of 2020. Um, and so that was the second piece that I made for this show. And how's your COVID going so far? Um, my COVID experience, much like many other people's COVID experience, has been pretty depressing. Um, just not really knowing what to do and how to navigate it, just knowing so many other things that are going on, whether it be the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it be, you know, evictions going on um, through all of the tenants um, in Los Angeles. Um, but, you know, like many other artists, trying to do the best I can to make use of my time. And so that's kind of how my COVID experience has been. Not completely positive, but doing what, the best that I can to utilize my creativity and my art. And were you making the tufted rugs prior to the quarantine, or are you, is that a, a new development or one that's a continuation of? Yeah, so I had been tufting for a little bit over a year now. It's definitely something that I kind of picked up based on a way to self-express. So I had been working in restaurants since I was in high school, through college, through my years outside of college, um, you know, just working as a service worker and in hospitality. And I think I was extremely fatigued by it and angry with, you know, the state of 
the service industry and the working class struggle in general. And so I think that rugs really helped me express my anger and upset over all of the well, things that have been happening. Too, right? Yeah, yeah. It's something that I'm also really pissed off about yeah. too. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I went to UCLA with a major in communications and a minor in the music industry. I yeah, I mean, 99.9% .9 white women from in sororities. It's yeah, like a fucking disaster. Not, yeah, just not fun. Not fun at all to be a communications major at UCLA, that's for sure. Um, minor in the music industry, you know, is, is very comparable to, to getting like a master's in business, like getting an MBA, which again, I personally feel like is fucking useless. And it teaches you a lot about capitalism, which is something that I grew to be very upset about. Um, but yeah. You can see that. You can see that in your work. Your work is like very, like, it is very political. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of the basis of what my work entails, um, is very social, politically forward work. Um, and I'm sure many other people who are artists kind of focus on those things as well, just because when you're so pissed off about things and, and the state of the world, whether it be in the music industry or in the service industry, it's, it's some, you need to take out that anger some way, somehow. Um, and the best way to do it is through creation rather than like beating up your employers. And how, uh, yeah, how did you get into making rugs? Yeah, so I actually, I actually got into making rugs with an artist that I was working with in the music industry. So I was working at uh, this record label called Future Classic who represents like flume and shit. And I, I met this artist there and he w showed me this video of tufting and we were just like so intrigued by it. And we were just like, fuck it, let's just buy everything. We just watched a bunch of videos online of like, you know, tufting is a craft that is utilized mostly in China and India. And we kind of watched videos of people tufting on YouTube, just like extremely blurry, don't really know what's going on. Um, and we kind of adopted those practices. But the truth is, tufting is becoming very popular um, among artists right now. And there are people that, you know, distribute the same tools that are distributed in like India and China. But I think, again, it comes to the same problem of capitalist monopolistic ideas of, of taking a certain tool that had been used in India and China and, and kind of monopolizing that to Americans. And that's something that I, again, is really hard for me when I'm tufting because I get all of my supplies from a distributor in China because I don't want to be buying from monopolizers yeah. um, in the U.S. But I'm gonna name names. Yeah, it's insane how pissed off I am and how I'm just like <laughs> fuck this. You know, like working in the music industry, obviously, it's not a working class struggle. It's definitely a little bit more white collar, but there are definitely people that I know in my life, especially, who have just been working at literally the minimum wage, if not less. Yeah. My starting wage as an A&R assistant was $27,000. Yeah. And that's not even and taxing my things out. Absolutely. And it's, it's fucking horrible. Yeah. Yeah, like more more white collar workers should understand that like not many people, especially with a degree, who are focusing in the music industry in general. Totally, totally. Right, it's extremely classist, and it's also quite racist because I mean the American education system in general I find is also classist and racist, but. It's, it's sort of built in the same structure in the same way where people are just unable to get to certain places because of the way that, I guess, the room is laid out for them in general. Like, you have to be rich and white in order to be, like, you know, an agent assistant or a desk person at UTA and work for seven fucking years at $27,000. Yeah. Well, like, this whole thing, like, who's American? Like, this whole battle, like, who's American? No one. I refuse to be American. <laughs> you know? I disown my American identity. Exactly. Take me to Canada. What's the future of 
the future of the pandemic. Between now and November, what's gonna go? Um. You know, I can't. I can't really say. I'm like definitely a doomer. I don't really have faith in, in many things. But, but for me, I think to continue what I'm doing in, you know, making rugs, expressing myself, and and really creating work. <laughs> um, but but essentially, just the future for me is just creating work and documenting many things that are happening that really affect me and especially affect the working class um, and well, to continue those really conversations. I remember we talked about this last time I was here. There's so much history in rug making that, that I love to kind of adopt. And, and, and in a lot of rugs in a way, I remember we were talking about how Liv was here like a few, like a month ago and she brought this like AR-15 rug that was like documenting World War II and it, and I think that's kind of where the the basis of my rugs comes from as well as really documenting, you know, my feelings and and what's happened. Um, because with the Junipero Serra rug, I know that when they toppled that, not not only in Los Angeles but in San Francisco too, it really resonated with me because I grew up um, in Southern California in Long Beach and. Um, I went to elementary school in Cerritos, and we would visit the missions literally yeah. from from Before third grade, third grade, fourth grade, grade, fifth grade. grade. Yeah, you had to build a, fucking a mission. You had to build a mission, and you had to like glorify. Yeah, it's insane, and and to actually visit those places. Yeah, it's insane. It's also sad. It's, it's also like, well, like look what's happening like yesterday. Jacob, like everything. Mm-hmm. Going Let's on. Jacob, like, like, yeah. We're in the midst of all this fucking bullshit. Yeah, it's. I only hope for it to get more chaotic oh, because. Like oh, absolutely. I'm a radicalist. <laughs> I'm a. I'm. I'm fucking Antifa. So come and get me, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm happy to be here. I'm I'm so grateful that my rugs are even noticed in a way. <laughs> Thanks so much. Nicholas Muhammad, um, Los Angelino, born and raised, um, yeah, artist, <laughs> visual artist, founder of a nonprofit, yeah. The work I did tonight um, was COVID, COVID, COVID work. Um, came from like I was making work based on the idea of veils. And then my production wasn't able, I didn't have those resources anymore. And so then it's just, I had a cheerleading outfit I had. And I was like, wow, like a cheerleading skirt is kind of like a veil in a way. Yet it's acting as athletic as well. And I was like, oh, the form could do something. Um... 
that's pretty interesting the form of a skirt but then also just the context of it a uh, cheerleading skirt having a narrative i thought was interesting um just really me being resourceful you know just like i sewed the skirts myself um i bought a pattern off of etsy <laughs> and um i was just like well i don't fight instead of like because i was doing like these sculptural like painting assemblage things i was just like well, what if like a skirt did that rather than like wood um and yeah and it just kept going and i just challenged myself with like actual lace fabric different fabrics like i've always like had like a social context to my work um always like questioned like things that we take for granted and um and uh where we are today um it kind of just i would say like heightened it but i would say the the work my work has always kind of challenged those things and the sports context has always been there i think it has been more interesting because of sport and social context has been like it's all time high. Um, so I think it's just brought me more viewership. So it kind of like was a blessing in disguise. <laughs> How do you feel about everything like with the Bucks, like current time, you know, with the Jacob situation with Bucks and stuff like that? Do you feel, I mean, what's your feeling on the whole like part of politics? Because, you know, we have a president right. calling them out saying, oh, you shouldn't get involved. Right. But these are our idols. No. Yeah, I mean, of course, like, you're proud and you love it. I think what's most interesting is the business being communicated in this politic, de political decision. You know, because we always had, like, the reference of, like, Muhammad Ali and him being so much of a figure of, like, social socialism or social politics in, in sport. But now it's like they're communicating like business aspects of why they're protesting and how that affects other people's things to promote change, which has been really interesting that we've never really had before. Because we just see like, oh, you're standing up for something. But people don't understand, oh, you're standing up for something and, you know, and then you're pushing change and who's suffering and what's the business of that. And to me, like, that's been very interesting for us to be educated in that as the public. But do you feel like we're having a moment right now? I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, you, you're like me. You have all these references. Mm -hmm. But now we're, like, in the moment. Right. We are our own references, you know? Exactly. And I think it's great. Like, I mean, I think kind of social media kind of prepared us for that. Yeah. Because everything is so, like, the now. I mean, this generation is, like, the now. Like, if it's not about the now, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because we don't know if the future matters or if it even is going to exist. And the past is irrelevant. Yeah. And so it's like, live in the moment, you know? I think that is really our time. And we kind of were being prepared for it last year. And I would say the last two years we've been prepared for it. Just like, what's being celebrated is about people's actions in the now. They become overnight celebrities. Yeah. And so I think now, but it is a beautiful thing about just like not giving a fuck and just reacting and reacting in real time and living with the consequences, good or bad. Do you think artists should have the social, con uh, the social conscience? I think if they believe it, because it also can be trendy. And then with, with trendy... Um, or people just trying to gain attention because that's a level of attention, I think it's very dangerous. Yeah. And so I think it's just intention. Like, because the same people that, because there's a lot of people that have been preaching these things for years. Yeah. And then, which is great, some of them are getting their, their platform and they're getting celebrated, which is great. And they deserve it. But then a lot of people just, you know, hop on a bandwagon. Yeah. And so... I think it's it's a very dangerous thing, and a lot of people aren't edu fully educated in it, that are the loudest. Um, so I just think it just boils down to just intention. How do I feel being an American? I feel it's kind of like a Malcolm answer. It's like I'm here, and it's like I've been burned, but it's like 
what am I going to do to deserve to survive and thrive? That's how I feel. It's like I'm not leaving. I'm not trying to escape, but also I'm fighting for what's deserved to me, what I'm owed. So I feel like it's just like, you know, it's just kind of just boils down to like no one's going to give you anything, you know, but at the same, but it doesn't have to be selfish. It could be very communal. And so it's just really figuring out how to navigate to survive and thrive. But because it's a weird mm-hmm. thing, like who's an American, you know? Correct. Like, you know? And what is who is an American, and what makes an American? Um, and who has ownership of that? Right. Very true. Who has ownership of being an American? Nobody does, and nobody has it really. It just it's just becoming very gray. It's really gray. And I and I just really feel like, you know, I think it's just. I mean, honestly, it's like who's anything really. Yeah. But I mean, look at the world. Look to America. Mm-hmm. The American culture rules the world. Right. But yet, the people that like run the culture don't even feel like, am I American? You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Am I American? Like, fucked up. Yeah, man. It's crazy because it's like, you know, also just like being able to travel right before COVID, yeah. you know, internationally and you see like people's sense of pride in their culture, but then also obviously attraction to Hollywood and yeah. American culture. And it's so prevalent in like third world countries and even like European or even Asian markets. It's so heavy. It's And it's like... You know, you question what is America because it's like I'm in like the Philippines in a third world country where a 7-Eleven is their Walmart and they're teaching me about Steph Curry and KD. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, like I'm like miles away from where they at. Yeah. I, I grew up playing basketball and they're teaching me and I'm yeah. like in their native language. And so I'm like and flip flops. <laughs> And like basketball is life over there, and I'm like, yo, I'm come from, LA. I'm like, I'm come from, like South Central, where like basketball is life, yeah. and I'm like, over there it's different, like it's a, it's it's treated just as high as the Catholic Church, yeah. so I'm like, so you really question like America, like what is America? Because the culture of America, is it's becoming, I mean, it's everything, so. You really just like, okay, we're just all the same, you know, because we all believe in the same things. But are we? But are we? I mean, I guess that's just a question of like, you know, it's like I look at it from two directions. Like I look at it from a direction of, you know, people that are, you know, what you practice what you preach and what's the letter of the law? Because the letter of the law was true. We owed a lot of things. Yeah. But then at the other other side of things, it's like, you know, it's like in a strange way, what are we doing to control our own situations? Because a lot of things are just like, you know, we're reliant on, you know, government assisted things. We're relying on all these things. What are owed to us? But at the same time, it's showing that it's the hard, the hardest process ever to get approved for things and they're cutting it and they don't care. Yeah. So it's like, what are we doing to self-sustain? No, and and, and yeah. taking ownership is a crazy thing. Like right. Personal ownership is a big deal. Like right. That's like an like a addict kind of thing. You know what I mean? It's right. Like the minute you take ownership, then you're like owning your own actions. Right. And then you're actually part of the process, so you actually exactly. can control the flow. Exactly. So that's the whole thing. Right. You know? It's kind of like the Jackie Robinson thing, where yeah. it's like... You know, like some people say Jackie Robinson was the worst thing that ever happened to black people. Be- right. Because he killed the Negro League. Because yeah. if it's like if and Jackie Robinson was even the best black baseball player because all the better ones before him denied to go to the major leagues. Yeah. But it's like if Jackie Robinson never went to the major leagues, the Negro Leagues had a better, better game. So yeah. it would eventually force people to not watch the major leagues, to watch the Negro League. If if black people own the Negro League, then they have financial gain because they have better entertainment. But because Jackie Robinson integrated 
and brought in the talent to the major leagues, then it killed the Negro League and killed the business opportunities. Yeah. And so, and so it's kind of like that idea where it's like in, integration you think is the best American thing. Could ever mm-hmm. be a full integrated society? Or do you think it's well, I think when it's always about when it's always a measuring tool, there's always going to be divide. When the measuring, especially money, you know, it's, it's like human instinct of survival, of like who am I, who are you, how, and what is the measuring tool? And so, if the measuring tool is, if there's always a measuring tool, there's always going to be some divide. Yeah. It's human instinct of survival, and it's and it sucks to say it that way because it, you can survive through numbers but it's just greed that makes it a divide thing 100 i always mm-hmm. felt like the mm-hmm. world's problems isn't social it's, that, it's macroeconomics exactly you know? it's definitely economic and that's why i was saying like the, the, the nba economics. things is more interesting because they're bringing money into the, the conversation in business it's not just about like injustice and you know i have a right to do this it's like yeah, but then also I have finance, I have gain, and I have a role here, and if I, and they communicating that role in the business of everything, yeah. which is to me great because for for a kid, I imagine in this is hearing all those conversations, they are clicking in their mind that like, oh, what is cool is also a financial gain. Yeah. It's not just cool to be cool, yeah. you know. Which my generation is like. We thought it was cool to be Michael Jordan. Like, we want to be Michael Jordan, but we didn't know how much power. It's not to say. Yeah. It's like that's always been a little bit of an exit. It's mm-hmm. like sports and certain things or, mm-hmm. like, you know, music. You know what I mean? Right. There's been certain kind of things that like, oh, that allows you. But at the same time, mm-hmm. okay, so, like, you escape that. Mm-hmm. And what is it that you're escaping to? Right. You know? Exactly. And it's, and it's tough because you, you, it's like you have peers that are in the music industry. And just talk about the the black hole you get sucked into as far as s- signing a deal and you know the money that you get is just an event it's just a loan and then yeah. all the headaches of just like your creativity and then now your creativity is being controlled by somebody else's idea of what they want to put out yeah. and it's tough because even as a visual artist it's you know you it's a dance for a lot of creatives yeah. of like that dance of integrity and being experimental and being and corporate. You know, it's like all creatives deep down want a little bit of flash. They want to be popular. They want attention. They want deep love. down. They want love. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just like how much can you dance or how much, yeah. you know. And then it's always just like some some people are just so masterful of retaining like their composure and keeping like their integrity and making that, da- keeping that dance in the commercial world, and just, yeah. you know, just not fearful. It's yeah. some people have that real gift, and um, but it's tough for a lot of artists because you know we, we have children and we make children, and yeah. we don't want those children to get lost in the system, <laughs> you know. No, it's a fine line because it's yeah. like any money to provide. It's like any cheap to have kids. Right. You know, I'm shit. Exactly. But at the same time, you want your identity, but like, yeah, I mean, it's a complex battle, and now you have this existential battle of like Trump, and like the whole world. Right. Yeah, and it's real, like, you know, it's like you got to be in the middle. It's like yeah. we know, as results have showed us, like being a pure rebel doesn't get us results. Yeah. Pure rebel, just it's not that. And then, of course, you don't want to be a Uncle Tom, or you don't want to be like a Benedict Arnold and just buy into just for the money and you're not really doing anything. But it's a lot of you got to be in the middle, you got to make the dance to get pure results. Yeah, which is hard. That's a hard sell for a lot of people. It's hard. You know what I mean? It's a hard sell because it's like you don't want to also look like you're like, you know, you don't want to be the one that's like, right. Oh, especially, especially the public. Right, and especially the public has expectations because they want they want you to do what they want you to do, yeah. you know. But it's like that's not gonna get us the win. It's about winning. Yeah, we gotta win. So it's like, you know, it's like sometimes 
You know, I just gotta do get the rebounds. Yeah. You know, I can't get them. <laughs> right. Look at all these boxers. Look at Mike Tyson. Look at all these boxers. Right. You gotta you gotta adjust. And they come to like man in the ring, hands down, fighting each other for like you know what I mean? But everything that goes into that is all this bullshit. Bullshit. Right. And so yeah, I mean that's why I kinda use sports in a lot of my work. It's yeah. just it's a great analogy for s- social context. Yeah. You know, and it's not too heavy handed because sometimes even myself, like I get a little turned off by like just heavy handed political imagery. Because we get it so much, and so to me, it, it doesn't mean anything. But the, also, it all depends on like I think artists' beliefs and artwork. But for me, it's just like I want a sense of of room for me as a viewer to breathe and work. And so, and if it's like if this artist is so much as trying to like strangle you to say like you believe this believe this believe this yeah. this is what's right and this yeah. is what's wrong it's like uh, there's no room for me to like dream in here it's yeah. not to make so for me like as an artist it's like you know i want to give you the questions you know propose it yeah but i'm not gonna give you the answers i'm gonna give you space 